welcome back guys. Today is the day we're gonna be doing our mid set update for the limited uh, set review. Uh, Yanks is on the call. We picked a couple of cards that we wanted to discuss what the original rating was and why it has over or underperformed our initial expectation from those cool stuff articles and videos that we posted at the beginning of the set. So we're gonna go ahead and start with Michiko's Reign of Truth. This saga has definitely outperformed uh, for what I thought was going to happen. What do you think, Yanks? I think we knew that this card could be good. It could be very powerful in the right deck. I think what we just didn't realize was that it's going to be good in every deck. Um, yes, because the amount of just random enchantments and artifacts is so high that, like, even if you don't have an enchant artifact synergistic deck, this is still going to be getting you some good, like, boosts. Yeah, it's it's takes absolutely no effort for this card to be giving you plus three, plus three, plus four, plus four. You just have that incidentally in white most of the time. Yeah. I mean, at the very worst, even if you have like no synergy, it's plus two, plus two, plus two, plus two, and then it is a three, three or whatever, which is just yeah. great. Um, I, I don't, what did we give this originally? So we gave it a split rating, a one, three. And I think the three is probably close to right, but I think it's probably just a three with even or a three with three at the low end. Yes. So it is like a three slash three five. It's it's a three yeah. with like some strong upside. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. The the floor on this card is just non-existent. It is the floor is up up here. So that's just the biggest thing. I do agree that this is, you know, not a four or a game winning bomb by any means, but there's just no world where we're going to be playing this at a one and they're so good in multiples and holy smokes i love everything about this card <laughs> uh yeah the backside just is a big creature there's no way that we don't just end up with a three three on the back for two mana that has pumped and done a bunch of damage already so uh let's go ahead and talk about the spirited companion the two mana doggo that when it enters the battlefield you draw a card what was our initial rating uh two five okay yeah this is a card that is overperformed because there's a lot of ways to get this back. There's the White Lord, there's also the White Vehicle, which brings back two drops, and it's we've kind of underestimated how important the random enchantment creatures would be as well. Yeah, I think the the fact that it's enchantment is great. It replaces itself, so it certainly has a low floor, and we knew that at the start. But like you said, there's so many ways to get this back or replay them. Um, in black or blue, you've got some ninjutsu that can get it back. With green, you've got the 4-3 uh, Kami that returns an enchantment and gains you life at the same time. Yes. Like, Ooh, that, uh, that, well, we'll, well, we'll get to that card, but that's a yeah. nice combo uh, within its particular archetype because we want in the white-green, we want this deck because or this creature because it's an enchantment and then there's some nice synergies that go hand-in-hand -hand with it. So I'm happy to bump this to a three. I don't think there's any deck where we're cutting this, and I, I kind of take this as a sign that white is open. Yeah, I agree with all that. All right, let's go ahead and move on to... Uh, apparently there was no blue cards that we really saw that have super over or underperformed. Uh, just to give you guys a little bit of a background, we typically like to talk about any cards that were, you know, if it's split rating, maybe it's super high or super low, uh, maybe remove one of those splits or a full point difference for the interaction. If we're like, oh, something's like a two and a half, it's above playable, but not great. But then it's, you know, a three, which is still above playable. We kind of just leave those off. So the Chain Flail Centipede, three mana, two, two, that uh, reconfigures for two and gives target attacking creature plus two plus oh, or is just a two, two on its own, has again, kind of similar to the dog outperformed uh, at three mana, getting a nice artifact creature in play is super important. Goes very well with like Faceless Kami or Kami of Terrible Secrets is a really nice curve there. Yeah, I think what at least I missed on this card is just the, like, I wasn't happy with the fact that you're paying three for a 2-2, two, two, and then when it equips or reconfigures, you're not getting any stats. You're just getting a trigger on attack. But I think what I missed was that this format is pretty small, so the plus two plus so just enables, you, enables attackers uh, so much better than I was expecting it to. Okay, so yeah, that's, I mean... I haven't found that this thing is a huge beater or makes my creatures a beater by any means. It's kind of nice on like the 1-1 blue flyer if you have it or the white 
a samurai flyer if you have it, but I haven't found that the plus two has been shining for me. I've found that having the artifact with things like the Blade Master, with the uh, Terrible Secrets, and a couple other things are just really good to have this, or Michiko, um, or with uh, Ink, uh, Ink, Assassin's Ink. Yeah. Yeah, those cards is like sort of where you get this. I don't want to waste a card slot on um, a terrarium type of artifact. So anytime I feel like I can attach the artifact to a body just kind of enables everything that Black wants to be doing in most of those pairings for me. So um, our original rating was a two. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is a two, five, a three in the right deck. Yeah, the, the more artifacts you want, which, you know, black is a lot of, black white's an artifact deck, black red's an artifact deck. Um, it's certainly best in those, but uh, it's fine to play in any deck and a little better than fine. Yeah, agreed. All right, this is the next card, the Silencer, uh, two, one for two mana with Ninjutsu, and when it deals combat damage to a player, you can discard a creature card, destroy target creature or planeswalker this is actually one that has underperformed for me a little bit just because there isn't a lot of creatures i'm willing to discard um and it is a little tough to get in it doesn't get a ton of reoccurring value what are your thoughts on it i'm the same i think this card has been far worse than i anticipated uh you do get some great you know turns with it where you can get something back if you're in a racing situation and uh ninjutsu back something and you're willing to discard it to kill their big flyer or their life linker that's changing the the race but most of the time i find myself just playing this as a 2-1 um which is just not exciting what was our original score we gave us a 3-5 yeah i think this is like a 2-5 um yeah and it often just plays like a 2 yeah i'm still not cutting the card because there is that upside to deal with the bomb you know you're gonna get uh, a creature back into your hand with the ninjutsu ability so it usually has a uh um a card to discard although if you bring back a saga creature that doesn't work but True. um so you do have some upside still but yeah a lot of times it's just a two one for two i have on occasion cut the card uh, cut the card because i didn't think i had enough creatures in the deck to warrant playing this like if my deck has you know three or four sagas in addition to just being like at seven creatures including this i've had that a few times um and that seems to be the more happened more often than I expected with the saga creatures. Yeah, I can definitely see there being scenarios where you cut it. I haven't run into that yet, but I can definitely see it. Oh my god, Yanks, you're running more creatures in this format than I am? Yeah, because I, I, I don't count the saga creatures as full creatures. Oh, I do. Because if I, if, if I have a handful of saga creatures that I can play on turn three, I'm dead before they do anything. That's why and you gotta no run the one-drop creatures. saga creatures. <laughs> uh, the the white one and or the, I'm sorry the um red one and the black one are both great I love them yeah oh, I, both of those cards are good no no argument with that <laughs> all right so this is I think one of the cards that I fought for to put onto the list here is the Nazumi Blade Blesser yeah this three mana three two uh, gets Death Touch and Menace if you control artifact enchantment uh, you can do one and one it doesn't need to be both. And this thing is kind of a beater. I get two for one on this a lot because it's just super easy to accidentally have uh, an artifact and enchantment because you get beetle, you get doggo, you get all sorts of things, the chain flail. And uh, it's super easy to just incidentally get this thing death touch or, uh, or menace and or both. What are your thoughts on it? The card's been good. I want to punish it because I can never remember which is which. Like, which gives you Death Touch and which is Menace. I know it says it right on the card, but I always get them mixed up. Yeah. Um, I think the card's good. Um, I don't... To me, I don't think it's overperformed what we gave it, which was a three to begin with. Yeah, I uh, think I still want to stick with a three, but yeah. I think but, I just... It still performed better than I've thought. Yeah, I think it's yeah certainly worth talking about because I think we gave a lot of caveats in our initial review, like with white black in particular like well how easy is it going to be to have both and it turns out it just is easier than we anticipated yeah it's it's really not hard um yeah. all right life of toshiro uizama we've got the uh uncommon black saga that kills x ones and turns into a reasonably costed two three that helps you cast some stuff uh what was the initial rating a three all right this is 
probably just the three five. It's super strong. I knew the amount of X ones in the deck was was a lot, but I a little bit underestimated how big a blowout this would be to those X ones. Yeah, I think I was on board with how many X ones there were. I just didn't think I would care that much about killing them uh, because they're X ones and not that impressive. But there just are, you know, there's more of them. Or they're, the ones that exist are seeing more play, and they're more impactful than I thought they would be. Yeah, I, I do remember in with the Black Shrine, that was one of our like our few disputes yep. in the set, because I was yep. like, oh, I'm all about this with how many X ones. But for some reason, I was very high on that Black Shrine for the exact same reason, but I thought this would be a little bit more situational because it um, you want to get the Shrine down early to get the creature and start getting the discount spells. So I thought it would just be a lot less likely you actually kill something with this. But that just hasn't been the case. Like, you know, most two drops are X1s, which is just fine. Yeah, agreed. Um, you know, the backside is nothing exciting, but you've gen you've a lot of times already gotten your cards worth of value before you even get to the 2-3. Yeah, and at the end of the day, it's still two mana for a 2-3 that does a thing. Yeah. And it's an enchantment. Love it. Have you ever activated that ability? No. <laughs> Yeah, me neither. No. I don't think I've ever seen. I don't think I've ever even seen it activated. No, me neither. Actually, now that you think about it, maybe maybe I've seen it activated once. But it's an enchantment, and I love bringing it oh, back yeah. and doing stuff. Yeah. All right, Virus Beetle, similar to Doggo, guys. This is a pretty key card in anything that wants artifacts and enchantments, which most black decks do. Um, the virus beetle, especially in multiples, can be quite annoying. It's a good thing to bring back with a white vehicle. Um, all in all, I think this has been much better than I expected. What do you think? Yeah, it's it's remarkable how it basically is the same card as the dog, right? Yeah. It's a, it, it generates a one-for-one one with the 1-1 one, one body. It's an artifact. That was an enchantment. You've got the same sort of benefits there. This is slightly worse um, because... Eventually, they run out of cards to this card, where you are always happy to draw more cards. But this has still been way better than I thought it would be. Yeah, the, the, we're, the, the opponent is not running out of cards at, uh, nearly as much as I thought they would have, because with the ninjutsu, and there's a lot of draw mechanics, even white has a lot of recursion, um, where we're bringing things back. Red has like the red general that lets you play stuff out of the graveyard. So hands are staying full much longer than they do in most sets, giving this beetle you know a longer lifespan within the game. But also, it's just a really annoying card. Uh, it triggers all those really important artifact uh, abilities, which I love, like the Blade Blesser. This Blade Blesser into, like, Saga or something. Oh my gosh. So good. Yeah, and cards like this and the dog also have the kind of added benefit. They make people play bad against them. Because they, even if it's right, they just don't want to trade with them. Because yeah, they've already gotten, gotten the card. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, even though the right decision may be just to trade with the card... A lot of times people won't do it. I agree with that. That is definitely a thing because the feel bad of like, oh, they already got my other card yeah. or they got an extra card off of it. So trade is no good to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What was the rating on the bug? We gave it a two. Yeah. So this is a solid two, five, a three in most decks. I, I think I'm almost yeah. just fine to give it a three. Yeah, I think I'm fine giving it a three as well. If you have absolutely no way to recur this or replay it, then it's probably down to a two, five, but. Honestly, I've cut that silencer. I don't think I've ever cut a beetle. Yeah, I don't think I have either, actually. <laughs> yeah, so this is just a three. Like, we are very yeah. happy for beetles. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about uh, Geothermal Kami. This uh, four mana, four three has definitely overperformed. I was not expecting Selesnia enchantments to be so stinking good. Holy smokes. And this pairs well with all of them. You know, there's sagas in every single color. Color Getting your sagas back, great. Um, you know, cre enchant creatures that are locked down can get out of that enchantment lockdown, which is awesome. Uh, this card, what was our initial rating? 2-5. This is a solid 3 for me. What do you think? So it's interesting. I agree that this is massively overperformed, and I agree with bumping the rating. But kind of have a very different take on why in that... I, I do I do not particularly like the green white deck. I think it can be it can be great if you get all the right pieces, but I I've found the deck very hard to get into and haven't played it much and haven't played against it very much. But I like the fact that what I like about this card is it's not a, just a green white card. Like you said, there's yeah. sagas in every in every deck. There's enchantment creatures in every deck. Um, you know, you can get that value 
uh, in any color pair. Certainly, yeah. I think this good this card is good in any green deck. Um, getting back, uh, ooh, getting back the green black Gloom Street Stalker. Oh, oh, I've done that loop. That's a ooh, lot of fun. That's so <laughs> good. Holy smokes! No, um, I, I think. And then you you use the Gloom Stalker to get this back from the graveyard, and then you play it and get oh, back the Gloom Stalker. <laughs> so good. It's it, it's. Mwah, chef's kiss but this uh card the only reason i brought up selesny is just because the enchantment archetype in general oh, is yeah. strong and that's Agreed. kind of where that home is for the most part but again this is you know it's not hard to find enchantments or artifacts kind of wherever you are enchantments I, or i'm sorry artifacts i think are a little bit more difficult if you want those synergies you have to put a little bit more effort into making them consistent like with the anvil deck but tommy uh, geothermal kami it is not hard you will find a reason to play this and any green deck wants at least one some decks probably want even more it's like a giant balloon how funny is it just to beat somebody with a big balloon is it a balloon I, uh, no I it's not but that's kind of that's just what it kind of looks like like kind of like an old style like zeppelin is it like a table with legs it looks flat <laughs> it could be yeah All i right. think it's that uh it's that mysterium card with the guy holding up the with the animals mm. oh yeah, yeah yeah true <laughs> Uh, Harmonious Emergence. We have a four mana enchant aura spell. Makes a land a four five green spirit creature with vigilance and haste. Uh, it's also a land. And then when it's destroyed, the land stays alive because the land is indestructible. So you don't lose your land. This card has, I I, I, don't, I think it's about on par what I thought, but I think it's overperformed for you. Is that correct? It's overperformed for me. And I think it just overperformed its rating as well because at the time, and, and I'll say that I'll make, sure say this is my mistake um we were a little unclear on the wording with the chanted land would be destroyed um where whether or not death by damage would uh, apply to that because there are there were effects at times that um in past and i think they've changed the rules since then like sacred ground a card from stronghold would not protect a creature land that died to damage but it would for from like a navinral's disc or something that destroyed it uh so I think we hedged down a little bit, or I wanted to hedge down a little bit because of the rules question at the time. Um, but despite that, even if I, even if I had been solid on that working, I, it has still overperformed what I would have thought it was. Yeah, I was really impressed with a five, a five powered ass for four, for four mana. Like I'm about that life. Yeah. That is a life I want to be in, especially when you can ramp it out on three or four. Uh, like. You could be, with so many mana dorks in the format, you could be playing this on four and attacking for four. And the vigilance part of this means you're not actually down any mana each turn, which I think gives it a huge boost over the red version. That's that aggressive side. Um, there's a ton of times where I'm just like, okay, uh, I've got six mana. Yeah, six mana, you play this, you attack with it, they double block it, and then you still have two mana left, including itself to fight instant cast fight spell and two for one them, which feels super amazing. And not a lot of creatures beat this uh, four or five power toughness creature on the battlefield. Yeah, getting through to five toughness is very difficult in this format for anything that's not green, and even green can struggle a little bit with it. There's like one big green dork, the, the dog, right? And then there's yep. like dragons, and that's kind of it. Yeah, I guess the the big uh, the big pig in red can trade with it. Mm, that's true. What was that's the about original it. rating? A two. <laughs> yeah, I think this for me. There's a solid two and a half, three. Yeah, I agree. I think it's I think it's probably close to a three. <laughs> all right, we have uh, some multicolor cards for us. The Hidetsugu consumes all three mana mythic. Uh, and this is a card that we have decided is underperformed our initial expectations for chapter one. It destroys. Uh, Destroy each non-land permanent with mana value one or less. Chapter two, exile all graveyards. Chapter three, exile, return to the battlefield as a 3-3 three, three with trample. And then whenever this deals combat damage, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. When this deals damage to a player, if it has dealt 10 or more damage to that player this turn, they lose the game, which none of that seems super relevant uh i mean the the 10 damage thing uh if you're hitting them and this is a 10 10 you've already won probably several turns ago um yeah we thought it would be a snowball -y card because it's only three mana it turns into a three three if you can get it in it snowballs and becomes bigger but that's just not the case yeah i've i've had this card a few times despite being a mythic and 
it's been extremely awkward. I, I keep seeming to end up with scenarios where I want to cast it, but I can't because chapter one, while we expected chapter one to kind of not do much, actually would actively hurt me. Like I had tokens or one mana creatures or stuff, so I didn't want to play it. And then by the time I actually got to play it, it was so late that the 3-3 three, three didn't do anything. Yeah. Uh, our initial rating on this card was a four. And I think it's, I mean, we're not cutting this card. No. Um, but it's its not necessarily game winning on its own. It's super easy to deal with. Every single red spell kills it. Uh, the fact that, you know, it costs three. It's not in green, so you can't ramp it out really. Um, and then it doesn't let you attack because it doesn't have haste. So it does chapter one on three, chapter two on four. Flips on five. You can't attack until turn six. A 3-3 three, three Trampler is not a super great on turn six. No, especially when you basically spent turn three doing nothing. Exactly, because now they're not trading and actively, you know, you're not increasing your board state to help get this through later on. Um, so uh, what are we thinking rating-wise? Is this uh, as low as a three? I think it's a three. Um, it's, it's like situationally powerful as opposed to just straight up powerful. Agreed. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about Oni Cult Anvil, two mana artifact creature that says whenever one or more artifacts you control leave the battlefield during your turn, create a 1 1 colorless construct artifact creature token. This ability triggers once per turn. You can pay, you can tap, no pay, sacrifice, and drain a life, which is uh, sacrifice an artifact. So it can also sacrifice itself, which is kind of neat. Doesn't cost anything. Um, and it's also important to note that the sack doesn't say non-token like it normally does, so that the first time you sacrifice an artifact, you can continue to sacrifice the thing that it creates over and over again each turn to make that slow drain happen. Yeah, this card is, to me, other than outside of like your mythic dragons and planeswalkers, might be the most terrifying card in the format to see on the other side of the battlefield. Um, I don't know about if, that, but well, I, I just I, I feel like uh, you know yes, it's not on if if it has nothing going and they play it on turn eight, sure. But if they actually are running that artifact deck and play it on two or on three after playing a couple artifacts, I it's really hard to beat this once it, once it gets going. Yeah, I mean, I have played this deck and I've played against it, and my win rate with it is fine and my win rate against it is fine it, it gives your opponent the inevitability when they slam this because you know if they're running this they're going to have a few bunnies and a few other things but honestly it still does kind of require a lot and there are times where they need to chump they need to do something because they can't just sit back and do this there has to be some sort of board stall for this to be the thing um now there has been a time where i was able to um whenever an artifact leaves the battlefield on your turn, right? So I was able to suit this up with the chain flail, shoot, shoot up the 1-1 one, one artifact, attack in for three, uh, and then they have to make some sort of decision. They can trade with it on the spot to, or take the three. Regardless of what they do, I get another 1-1 one, one when it dies, and then I can drain for one more. So you get a little bit of power, but you need to have the synergy there. And uh, I haven't been in the situation that you have to where it's been so terrifying so often but i can definitely see it yeah i think the scariest part about it for me is seeing the first one and going i know i can't beat a second one that's true like and so there are so little i mean you still have some and you are main decking some artifact removal but it just stretches um the non-creature version of the artifact removal spells like your fade to antiquities or your um explosive efforts yeah, Fate into Antiquity has been a card that all is also, I mean, rating is correct, but it's more, you know, very easily uh, best of one playable than compared to what we might have thought. Yeah. All right, Patchwork Automaton, colorless. 1-1 one, one for 2 mana with Ward 2. Whenever you play an artifact, uh, you may put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on Patchwork Automaton. There's a lot of artifacts. Yeah, I'm amazed how late I see this card go around in draft sometimes. Um, it's a very specific deck, and I don't think it's one of the most popular archetypes. So it doesn't surprise me that, like, whenever you see a slightly less popular archetype, there is going to be a time where just all eight players are not in it or whatever. Uh, and then you kind of get lucky if you happen to be in there or shift late enough, like if you already happen to be in black 
you know, X for whatever reason, then you can start picking these up. Yeah, I, I, I guess to me, yeah, it's maybe late, maybe in the second or third packs. I'm amazed I see it late in pack one because if I see this early in pack one, I'm going right into that deck. Hmm. Well, That's interesting. Like, you don't need to do anything really to make this card good. You need to incidentally play two other artifacts, and you've got a good card. And if you have a, and if you end up in the mono artifact deck, this thing is scary. <laughs> That's definitely true. The mono artifact deck is very scary. Um, I don't know that I find this deck to be quite powerful enough for me to just want to move into it regardless of whatever I'm doing in the first, you know, half of the pack. But uh, yeah, this definitely, this sh should and could be picked up early because the deck is powerful if you're the only one sitting at it. But I just don't think that it's something I am super happy to commit to. I'm not necessarily looking to be in this deck, if that makes sense. I I agree with that, but what I like about this card versus, say, the Anvil that we just talked about is that picking it doesn't commit you to that deck. You can play this in your six artifact deck, five artifact deck, and it's fine. It's not amazing, um, but it's fine. That was weird. Sorry, guys. My overlay just forked itself for some reason. Eh. Need to edit that out. Um, I don't know if I agree with that. I feel like this does kind of, unlike some of the other things where, you know, you don't necessarily know if you, you don't need a maximum number of things to make it worth it. I think I do need a lot for me to be considering to run Patchwork Automaton. My average deck, I don't think wants it. Uh, yeah, I, I guess we're going to disagree. I think my average deck definitely plays this card. I just don't think I'm running that many enchantments in the average deck. I'm sorry, yeah, I mean, auras. I, I mean, artifacts. artifacts. My enchantments yeah. has been high in every deck, but I think like my artifacts are kind of hit or miss. There's been times where I'm like, oh shit, I drafted two red generals and I have no artifacts. Like that just kind of happens for me. Yeah, it's not impossible to cut this card. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't argue that, but I think on the average I'm playing it. Um, there's certainly color pairs where I'm on the average I'm probably not like green white, but most color pairs I'm probably playing this more often than not. Yeah, I, mean, I think when I'm not drafting the artifact deck, I'm you know at most running four artifacts, and that's you know I, I tried to get artifacts. I just drafted a uh, Orzhov. Uh, artifact enchantment deck and i was like trying and i was like running like paper decoys to try to fill up the number and i still only had five so i just i guess maybe there's artifacts that i'm rating too low that i'm not taking high enough to to fill up the amount of artifacts that you're typically running yeah maybe i uh, yeah you've probably played more than i have so it's different sample sizes but yeah it um, also just could be that i'm playing more selesnia and you're playing more whatever uh, that's certainly true <laughs> Um, all right, Roadside Reliquary, guys. This is a card that we rated for basically the Orzhov archetype, and it is kind of there. But I want to say it is good in most two-color decks. There's just, you know, if your deck is not super intense with the mana base and there's not a lot of, like, double-colored spells uh, in the format, I mean, there's those weird rare four-color things, but uh, most decks don't have those. So, you know, you've got the Beetle, you've got the Scrounger, and you've got a bunch of other things uh, that kind of make this worth running in a, most two-color decks. Yeah, I mean, we've seen, we've just been talking a lot about how easy it is to have an enchantment or an artifact. You know, as long as you have one of them, you're cycling this card. And if you can turn your land into a, you know, divination, that's even better. Yep. Um, I just think that's, I think... Basically, the sum up is and this card is that that happens more than we thought it would. Yes, and honestly, it doesn't really hurt you to just have this colorless land early, and then late game, it just replaces itself. Once you've yeah. reached the amount of mana that you need, uh, it just then becomes another draw, which is super powerful. And I have not had a hard time activating it for two mana or for two cards in most yeah. decks. Agree. Maybe you have to be a little patient, but that's okay. Yeah, um, you don't need to do this immediately. All right, so let's go ahead. I wanted to talk briefly. This will be the last thing we do for this video for the uh, recap. 
Sorry, my overlay went a little funky with this new overlay. So I wanted to talk about, these are the same archetypes that we laid out before. So we're gonna go over each color pairing, talk about whether that archetype has over or underperformed our personal uh, expectations. And if we thought, maybe there's more support for it than we initially thought. So let's go ahead and start with the Boros Samurai Yanks. What was your initial take and how is it performing based on what you've seen? Initially, I just thought it was kind of weird that the aggressive deck wants to attack with only one thing. Um, I found that hard to reconcile. Um, this has been way better than I anticipated. Uh, I hate playing Boros-style decks usually, and most of my best decks have been Boros in this format. I think this is the only color pair power that we, we actually butted heads on, because I loved the samurai theme. I was like, this is going to Tron up. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to do so much work and be impossible to stop. Um, I was very, very high on Boros going into the set. I will actually say it's maybe underperformed my initial expectations, not because it's underperforming, but just because I was like over the moon about it. And now yeah, I mean my best decks also are Boros, but I'm just like, oh, okay, well, I didn't kick ass as much as I thought I would have. <laughs> Yeah, now I've certainly had Boros failures as well. Um, but, like, I've had some very easy seven-win decks with Boros that just the, none of the games felt competitive. Um, you know, I had one 7-0 draft where... I think it was weird for an aggressive deck, it was winning in all different ways. It won by just killing everything. It won by a straight race where I ended up at one life. It won another game where I finished at 57 life. Oh my god, like, 57. <laughs> the, um, that's one of the... You samurai, I have never gotten to play the one that makes a samurai get lifelink. Oh yeah, that I had that with the the captain. So I would just they kept chumping every turn, and I was gaining like eleven life. Jeez, goodness gracious! Yeah, so I mean, all in all, I think Boros is pretty high on the uh, the totem pole of archetype styles. So let's go ahead and talk about Selesnia enchantments. This is, sounds like something we've had vastly different experiences with. Um, this is something that is overperformed for me because I didn't think that it would be so easy to get such a high number of uh, enchantments. I didn't think Michiko's Truth would be as powerful as it is. I didn't think uh, Baseju Reaches, the green uh, enchantment, would be as powerful as it is. And then the five mana green Saga that puts 1-1 one, one counters on things and then turns into a 5-5 five, five haster. Oh my god. Like If you curve out into those, it's so strong and ends games super quickly. Yeah, I have played Celestia precisely zero times in this format, so I can't really comment on how strong I think it is to play. And I haven't played against it very much. Um, the times I have, I've had some matchups where they play a turn one generous visitor and it just snowballs if I can't deal with it. I've had others where the deck just didn't do anything at all. So I'm I'm kind of still where I thought it was at the beginning because I just don't have anything. Okay, yeah. Any um, evidence, really, either way. This will be one of my highest, like, Based on my expectations, this is the probably the highest growth uh, based on my expectations. So I I think part of it for me, and you'll see this in the next few archetypes we discuss, is I find green very hard to get into in this format. That's weird. Um, I find it one of the easier ones. Green and black tend to be, and not together. Like, I don't play much green-black, but, like, yeah. I find myself falling into green, so then I push into white. Or I find myself falling into black, so I push into red or into white. Yeah, I think for me it's mostly that I just, the green commons, while I think green is deep, there's like nothing I want to first pick there. That's, I don't, I, I agree with that. I don't think I first pick it very often, but I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of commons and uncommons that I value very highly that I, I don't think there's a lot of chaff in green. So I, I tend to feel like it's more open. Um, so this sounds very similar to what is happening in the artifact side of things, where maybe you are just undervaluing some of the green cards, like I'm undervaluing possibly some of the artifacts. Sure, yeah. Um, all right, yeah. let's go ahead and talk about Gruul. Uh, the modification, or one of the modification, this is one that I've played a fair amount, but haven't had a ton of success with. The modification theme doesn't quite feel strong enough. And uh, a lot of the payoffs for it are in black, like uh, Lethal Exploit. So all in all, I think it's interesting, but red seems a little weak, and the modification seems weak. Yeah, I've played Gruul a couple times, but 
neither one would you ever really say was a modified deck. It was just your classic gruel beats type yep. deck. Agreed. Um, modified just kind of came up incidentally here and there. Uh, I think the art type's fine. I mean, Red Gruel usually has... You know, it does what Gruel does. It's got some big creatures in green, it's got some aggression in red, and it's got some removal. Um, not not a super synergistic archetype, just one that's kind of a pile of good cards. I would put this in the middle of the pack as far as power for me. Um, bottom, middle-ish. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. Um, we have, what, 10? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's like... Six-ish. That's what we should do for the next time we do this for New Capenna. We should, before going into this, we should write down yeah. our ten in order and then compare. That, uh, I don't know why we didn't do that before. Probably because we're <laughs> not. Uh, Simic Channel Archetype. This is a deck I've drafted all exactly one time, and it was great. Um, that is one more than me. I have, yeah, I had, like, Turtle on the top end. I had, like, Graveyard Recursion. Um... You know, we had enchantment creature synergy in the in the green side of things. We had card draw in the blue. And yeah, it was great. And there's like the turtle, you can bounce and do things and then get it back with the common green spell that lets you get an enchantment plus a creature for value. And you're cycling through things like that. And it feels amazing. I feel like I still don't know what this deck is supposed to do. It's like, not really supposed to channel. I think it's just yeah. supposed to have green beats and draw cards. Like, because I've when I play against it, it just kind of does nothing, and then occasionally plays a turtle. And that's about it. <laughs> that's all I remember from all of my games against Simic. <laughs> yeah, mine was like, draw a bunch of cards, Besaju reaches the sun, or whatever that card is, the four-drop green card, and then that just kills yeah. people. Yeah, so I just... I'd wa I don't know if the deck is bad, but I just don't know what it's doing, so I would kind of put this near the bottom, because I just kind of don't get it. <laughs> okay. Uh when I played against it, it seems fine. Uh, I'll give it like a five out of ten. Uh, you know, in the order ranking for me. Yeah, I don't think it's awful. I mean, there's there's good cards. Um, let's, but yeah, you know, I just don't see how it comes together. Let's talk about is it artifacts? Um, this is a card I've uh, for an uh, archetype I have not drafted. I have no idea. I have not seen that uncommon played. The uh, artifact uncommon that's in the is it colors. I have not really... I've seen some people play it, but didn't really seem like it had any synergy. I've played this deck a couple times. One of my first... Not my first deck, but one of my first decks was a very good as an artifact deck, and played that uncommon, had multiple copies of it, and, like, it had draws that just felt like you couldn't really lose. Okay. But it also just would fizzle and do nothing. It feels um, like everything is a little bit low impact so if you don't draw the exact correct orientation of things then you're just gonna like get steamrolled if your stuff doesn't tron up in the correct way you just like get outmatched by a three three yeah you're, you're kind of relying on a lot of card velocity with things like the uh experimental the red egg um and you gotta hope that hits the right thing and then you're you're trying to cast extra spells with the cost reduction uh from the the uncommon like there, there's some power there when it all comes together, but it's it needs a lot to come together. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about Demir Ninjas. I've been a little underwhelmed. I agree. Not that it uh, isn't one of the better archetypes and the most supported, but like it's such bad tempo oftentimes, and like it does kind of need a lot. If you're, I feel like if you don't have the key pieces of the ninja, if you don't have like. Uh, you know, Ninja Lord rat, then you feel bad. Yeah, I feel like my Demir decks are not really playing as Ninja decks. They're just playing as Demir Control with a few ninjas. Same. Um, and for me, they haven't been performing very well. They've done okay with me. There are definitely times where you're right. Like, you, you, can, out you can tempo yourself with Ninja play. Um, but there are some sequences with that deck that just feel disgusting. Like with the the um, uh, the bounce the bounce ninja yep. and the uh, moon circuit hacker since it's ninja two for one cute. paper decoy Draw. as well yeah or even what I love doing with hacker right is if you if you're attacking with something with ninjutsu and they don't that already has it they don't block it you just ninjutsu this in for one and then re ninjutsu the other thing for the effect again yeah um you can do it twice in a turn or um. 
But yeah, on the whole, it, it may still be overdrafted. I, I felt like it was at the beginning of the format, and it's kind of, you know, it's Kamigawa, there's ninjas, so everybody loves it. So I think that might be part of it, but it has underperformed. For me, it feels like it's overdrafted because I never, when I play ninjas, I don't get the key pieces like the Rat Lord or whatever. So even when I do yeah. have a high quality of a high quantity of ninjas, they're not premium ninjas. So then I just out I just tempo myself into the ground and die because in order for me to get the value from the cards, they need to be ninjutsu in, and then I'm behind. Uh, and I think that that is compensated by you know you make up for that if you have things like the rat ninja or like the key ninjas with the lifelink and stuff like that, where I'm probably not getting them because they are like you said overdrafted. Yeah, agreed. All right, uh, Orzhov Artifacts Enchant Hybrid. I love this ar deck an archetype. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily the most powerful, but I've drafted it the most, and I do think that the uncommon is kind of necessary for this to be good, but I like it regardless. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I think this might be my most common drafted deck as well. It, um, it is mine for sure. Not close. And I think it's... it's Actually, I think it's probably for the reason... For the same reason we weren't that high on it coming in, is that it's not super supported in the sense that you don't need a million artifacts and enchantments to make it work. You just get those sort of incidental ones, mm -hmm. um, and you just kind of reaped a little bit of value each time, like from the Blade Blesser or from the from the Kami, or certainly from um, your uncommon signpost. Yeah. Um, yeah, there weren't a lot of pay payoffs for it. Um, you know, we had the uncommon signpost, and that's kind of it. Uh, we don't. I don't think I thought the blade bluster would be as good as it is. The kami um, of life or kami of terrible secrets, I didn't think would be as good as it is because I thought it would be harder to trigger. Um, so all in all, this has been an archetype that really takes no effort to get the pieces going. So even though there are little support and payoffs, it still does the thing it wants to do, and uh, and I think it's nice it fits really well with like the white vehicle that gets two drops back when you've got beetle and dogs and a bunch of high powered cards that bring you good value that this kind of feels like the value archetype that uh that can just really outpace and out tempo your opponent plus the white and black removal amazing so good and not only is it good some of it helps feed the theme right you've got your um your pacifism, your inter intercessors arrest, uh, and you've got your touch of the spirit realm, which both just sit there as artifact as enchantments, helping mm -hmm. to fuel your synergies. Yeah, one of the white removal even gives you a creature that like just helps you reach a, a maximum amount of creatures without needing to spend a ton of space on them as well, which is really neat. I like this archetype a lot. So Rakdos sacrifice, which I now don't really see it as sacrifice. I see it more as artifacts kind of yeah. it's like the red yeah. has a lot of artifact type things and the black has a lot of assistance for that with the chain and the beetle and a bunch of other things i'm not really sacrificing stuff unless i have anvil yeah agreed i mean that's really the old, well that or the um the red uh three four um I'm blanking yes. on the name of it right now. scrapyard scrapyard steel breaker I mean, even then, I'm not usually doing that unless I've got treasures with the scrapper. No, that's more of a threat of sacrifice rather than actual yes, sacrifice. Yes, exactly. So you don't need um, a high quantity of sack options because you just like, okay, well, I could sack and then you're in trouble. So I, yeah. I agree that the threat of activation is key, but you don't need to be activating it frequently. Yeah, I, I think Black Red, you're right, is more of a... It's more just of an artifact deck, although there's not even that many artifact payoffs. It just got a lot of artifacts. Agreed. <laughs> um, I don't like, I don't love the uh, archetype as a whole, but I've also seen what feels like some of the scariest decks in it when it comes together. One of the biggest payoffs is Red General in this deck. Yes. Yeah, you're getting back. It's an artifact, so uh, it's a colorless artifact, so it's not as relevant. The kunai is really cool, but the beetle and the chain, and there's just like a ton of other like incidental yeah, you, things that that work really well with this. Getting back the four drop, like you were just talking about the what's it called? The uh, scrap scrapper. breaker, yeah, or steel break scrapyard steel breaker. Yeah, that's um, a really nice thing to get back late game as well. 
Yeah, or you can channel the twin shot sniper and then get it back. Oh, I've done that a lot. That's one of my favorite things. Um, this archetype has been okay for me. It's moderately supported. I like removal. But again, I still think red is kind of one of the weaker colors. Yeah, I think red as a main is weaker color. I've liked having it a lot as my second color. Agreed. Um, second or splash. Yeah. All right, let's talk about Azorius vehicles. I We will probably argue about this. I don't have a whole lot of data to back it up, but I love it. It's so good. I think I've only played it once. It didn't do that much, but I don't think I had a very good version of it, so... You need the uh -huh. key pieces, and all the key pieces are uncommon. There's the, but there's a lot of pieces. Unlike, so at, fr at first we thought there was not support for this archetype because there was only one multicolor card. That's the signpost. But there are a ton of other things that really work very well. The white uncommon vehicle. There's the uh, blue uncommon vehicle. And when you have these things, and they kind of tron together. Uh, it becomes very tough to beat. And you don't even need the rare vehicles. But if you if you have them, it's out of this world. Yeah, this is, I mean, Celestia is probably the deck I've played the least and played against the least, but this is probably second. I haven't seen much of it at all. I've tried to force it a bit, and I will say that this is probably the archetype that's the most dependent upon having the pieces. If you try to put it together and it doesn't really work uh, and you don't get there, you have a piece of shit. Um, <laughs> but when you have it, it's a million dollars. Um, unlike a deck like Celestia, where I feel like even if you try and you miss, you still have a pretty fine deck, probably. Like, you have a bunch of pieces of cards that are just, they do a thing, and you're okay with that. This is like, oh, I missed, and now nothing in my deck is playable. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, moving on to Golgari Graveyard. This is not a color I've drafted a ton, probably only twice, but I will say Gloomstalker, the signpost uncommon, is probably one of the better uncommons in the deck, or in the format. Yeah, Gloomstreaker is great, um, and you've got multiple ways to sort of do some weird, you know, recursion stuff with the not from the graveyard because it exiles itself, but with the geothermal kami, um, ninjutsu. If you have black ninjutsu cards that go with this, or the green ninjutsu rare, why green has the best ninjutsu card in the format, I don't know, but it does. Yeah. Um, There's the uh, common two drop as well, which you can ninjutsu in a pinch if you can set it up. Yeah. With Menace, yep. it's not hard either. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, you you can just massively outvalue people with this card. Um, but I feel like the deck kind of is very dependent on it. <laughs> if you don't have Gloom Shrieker, I'm not happy to be in Black Green without some bo other bombs. I feel like I'm a little bit on the other side. I don't necessarily know that I agree, because I feel like green is, is deep and solid, and all the cards kind of do their own thing, and black has good removal and very solid and does its own thing. I feel like this deck doesn't need a ton of synergy to be fine. I agree for it to be good, you do, you do need that Gloomstalker, you do need bombs, but that can be kind of true of any deck. I feel like unlike the Azorius deck that needs the pieces to function, Bulgari really doesn't. You can just have a big creature and a lot of removal and then be happy. Yeah, I, mean, I think this comes back to what I said with green, is that I without those cards or Gloomstreaker, I'm probably not ending up in green. So Fair. And I probably value you know green a fair amount higher. Um, yeah. All right. So that is the end of our touch up review. Um, they, you know, like I said, these are some cards that have either under or overperformed some archetypes and our thoughts going in. Uh, we still have about a little over a month, month and a half of Kamigawa left. So please leave us a comment down below. Let me know what your um, experience have been with the format, both cards and uh, archetypes. We'd love to hear from you. And we will see you guys in a little over a month for the new Capenna uh, set review as well. So make sure you guys tune back in for that either live or here on YouTube. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.